are compressors attack and release times lying to you when you're mixing and mastering? See, compression to many is like a voodoo box. How the hell does attack and release time work? I'm gonna pass you the greatest aha moment I had in my career when it came to setting attack and release times on a compressor. See, I was reading The Audio Expert by Ethan Weiner, and it details the time constants an analog compressor basically revolves around. Now, before I read this, I had been duped twice into believing falsehoods about attack and release times. Falsehood number one, the attack and release time dictates how long it takes for a compressor to start and how long it takes for it to finish, like an on-off switch, and that was wrong. Falsehood number two, the attack and release time dictates how long it takes for the compression to transition to the re relative gain reduction and then return back to unity. Wrong. Well, what is it actually doing then? Well, let's get familiar with the letter E. Why the letter E? Because that's the mathematical constant electrical engineers use to consider charge and discharge times of capacitors. But wait, we're talking mix engineering, not electrical engineering. So let's learn more about what's actually going on. Attack and release values are based on what we refer to as time constants. Now, time constants are an electrical concept, as the capacitors used in a gain reduction circuit on a compressor don't instantly turn on and off. The current takes time to pass and charge and then pass back and discharge the capacitor. And this isn't happening in a one-to-one -one linear fashion. It occurs in a logarithmic fashion. And that logarithm is approximated by electrical engineers using the time constant E as a base value of approximately 2.718. Now, by using this time constant E, we can calculate the amount of gain decrease in decibels the compressor will apply for the attack time and the opposite for the release time. And this is calculated with the following. The charge equals one minus in brackets one over over E and the discharge time just equals one over E. They're polar opposites and inverse of one another. So here with this compressor, I've got a hundred millisecond attack time, 500 millisecond release. And I'm actually, so that is what the compressor looks like on a ramped signal from negative 20 to zero to negative 10. And we can see that it is not a linear curve going straight down. It's actually a logarithm. But at 100 milliseconds, is it actually compressing all the way? Well, actually it's not because we can see here, you've got two seconds here and then 100 here and it's approximately only doing 0.63 or 0.632 of the full game reduction and it's not actually fully compressing until about there which is 600 milliseconds 500 milliseconds it's starting to reach its full gain reduction and furthermore if we go to the delta signal which is the inverse of what's happening so what's actually being taken away you can actually see that logarithm in action there on the attack and on the release so we can actually cite that the greatest velocity of compression happens during the first time constant even though it isn't the time that it takes to reach the maximum amount of gain reduction so you can have a 100 millisecond attack time it's not going to reach its full gain reduction until four or five hundred milliseconds but the quickest speed of that compressor is going to happen during that first time constant because of its logarithmic action so from zero to 100 milliseconds it's going to be moving quite fast and then the rest is going to slowly tail off and this gives us a few little clues on how we can best use our compressor there are a lot of non-linear time dependent representations that this analysis fails to include but the crux of what i'm discussing and presenting here is that compression attack and release times are by most part logarithms and what you see as a dialed in millisecond time on a graphical user interface isn't always what will occur behind the hood. 100 milliseconds doesn't mean 100 milliseconds to reach its full game reduction. So when working on something, how can we use this scientific mathematical knowledge to our advantage? Well, it's taught me a few things when it comes to managing compression in the time domain. The first is compression experiences its fastest velocity during the first time constant. It's not a linear fashion like a one-to-one, -one, which means that slowing down compression times to 60, 70, 100, or even 150 milliseconds can still be a useful tool to have control over a signal without killing transients and still being able to manipulate the dynamics effectively. The next is release times. Too long a release time and that game reduction circuits can still be working before the next transient is coming through. And we've pretty much aware of this, so specifically in mixing, a faster release time of 10, 30 or 60, 70 milliseconds can be very useful to keep sounds up front and the compressor out of its own way. Ultimately, it's just the simple knowledge of knowing that the time domain parameters of a compressor don't work in an on-off fashion or linear exchange. And that gives us the power as mixers to make more educated decisions on what we do in a mix. I hope this lesson helps you understand your compressor better and dial in better mixes. Until next time, take care.